Good morning and welcome to our worship from Morningside United Church here in Edinburgh. I wonder if you were like me watching the football on Friday night. The sense of expectation was palpable. It was difficult to watch. And particularly as the second half ended and moved into the last few minutes, there was a sense of relief, but also a sense of frustration that we had not won victory over England. But there's also a sense of hope, because at least we're playing Croatia again on Tuesday. It seems to me then that this kind of anticipation, this game of football, is a bit like the execution of our faith. When we think about our faith, we're not thinking just how it manifests itself in the moment, but there's a real reassurance that the best is yet to come. And although it might seem partisan to wish that Scotland might do incredibly well in the Euros, it seems also that in our lives that we would want to flourish and do our best, assured that God tells us that the best is yet to come. These words, these moments, can become something which gives us strength in dark days. It also allows us to find a sense of proportion in how we choose to live. In this service, we'll be reflecting on that sense of knowledge. We'll be understanding that we have Jesus with us as the teacher, and we'll be giving an examination of the promise of God that he's there to take us into our tomorrows. The best is yet to come.
So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you come to us unexpectedly, even when we're unprepared and unwilling to respond. But this morning, as we quiet in our hearts, as we listen to the nudging of your Spirit, accept us as we are. Inspire us in our thinking. Fill our hearts with a sense of joy and open to us the possibilities of love and service to those around us. Reassure us that you are with us on our journey and that the best is yet to come. We know that your boundless creativity enthralls us and holds us in awe. We are stunned by your presence and creation through the activity of lives of men and women. And so hear us as we praise you for the gift of laughter, the ability to bring love and smiles to another's life, for the blessings of children and grandchildren, parents and friends, those who we share joy as well as pain. We praise you for the gift of compassion and companionship which transform and transfigure our loneliness and grief. But above all else, we praise you for the gift of Jesus, the prod of our conscience, the stimulator of our vision, the bringer of hope to despair, the creator of life out of death and light out of darkness. So this week, open our imaginations and our hands. Allow us to serve diligently, to use our talents well, to give us minds and hearts that treasure the precious and precarious gift of life so that we can grasp every challenge with energy and enthusiasm. But loving God, we also know that you are neither apathetic nor indifferent. You know that we've darkened the life of those around us by selfishness and greed. And so we come seeking your forgiveness. Hear us as we say sorry for being resentful and envious of other people, for being foolishly cautious and unwilling to risk anything to love and care for others for hurting people by gossip and unkind words, and we've turned our faith into a buried treasure rather than making it part of our daily life. Hear our sorrow and blot out our guilt. Change us into the people you'd want us to be. Touch us by your mercy, knowing that our sins are truly forgiven. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hear these words from our Gospel reading. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now, for the Spirit of Truth comes, and he will guide you into all the truth. If you're to sum up what we're hearing today, it's simply this, that there's more and there's more beyond, that we have something to look forward to, and that somehow things are going to be revealed to us. In our imaginations, we can often find ourselves sitting back and conjuring what it's going to feel like, at a wedding, for example, a young couple are thinking about their future, the blessings of children, and a lifetime together. If you're doing a school assembly, apart from the children whose minds might wander away from what the clergy are saying, there are others there who are going to be listening to stories of inspiration and opportunity, the teaching of values. And if you're doing a service in a care home, older people are often reflecting back on life and the words of scripture have a different kind of meaning. It resonates with the life experience that they've had. For many, hopefully, there's the blessing of seeing the golden thread of faith that imbues their life in its waft and weave of troubles and of blessings. The scripture today says this, there's more and there's more beyond. Pope John Paul wrote this, the gift of faith takes us to the truth which is given by the Spirit. He leads us into the purpose of God, which is a blessing and a gift of love. The Pope has it right. John Paul is gently reminding us that our experiences of the moment 
are experiences which allow us to see the possibilities of a future, but a future that's certain because we're not walking alone, but because Jesus is with us and the Spirit is nudging us into whatever will come. We all have expectations in our lives. We accept, expect things of our parents, of our children, of our partners. We look for success and progress. But in our scriptures we're being reminded in John's Gospel that there's a different kind of guiding taking place. The first part of the text tells us that none of us know it all yet. We're not know-it-alls. There are things that are unseen. We're not always promised tomorrow, but we are promised something. Jesus is looking at his disciples and he's saying, I have many things to tell you, but you might not be able to bear them now. And this would seem a strange thing for people. These are people who had eaten with him, prayed with him, followed him over his ministry over these three years, and Jesus is telling them there's more to be revealed. But if we think about it, none of us can be failed to be shaped by life. All of us have experiences that mould us, that make us what we are. The things that have gone before can form our personalities, can challenge our prejudices, can disturb our bigotry, and cause us to be all that is seen. Some of us have scars that are lifelong that speak about vulnerability. Others have scars that tell about difficult relationships or the cycle of family problems or habitualized behavior. We're being told in this particular reading that Jesus is in that moment, but he's taking us elsewhere. It seems to me then, rather like St. Paul says in the letter of the Corinthians, we see through a glass darkly, but they were then told, then we shall see face to face. And Job in the Old Testament tells us this, these are but the outskirts of his ways, but the thunder of his power, who can understand? When we're emerging from the lockdown, when so many in society have been vaccinated, when we're getting to get back to life and work out what that means, we're being gently reminded that we're still living in the darkness of the moment. But if we take God's hand, then light comes to us. Jesus says we have to be humble in all that we do. Become like little children, it says in Matthew's Gospel. Jesus doesn't want us to feel a sense of self-importance. He wants us to recognise that in our humility, that we need someone with us who will shape our future and will determine the ways, the ways of living in the truth, and the ways that living with possibility to serve and to love so that our lives can discover meaning. So the first thing we should recognize in the gospel is that we have a teacher. You see, the scriptures bring good news. God does not leave us in our blind ignorance. He educates us, he opens our eyes, he guides us to the truth. And notice in this particular text these words that should resonate in our minds and our hearts. He's going to guide us into all the truth. So this is suggesting that this is a process and it's lifelong. Perhaps this is an opportunity for older people to look back on their lives. How many of us acted rashly and stupidly when we were teenagers? Or in that sense of feeling immortal in our 20s or 30s, we made mistakes, we got things wrong, we stumbled. But the process that's been talked about here, this revealing of the truth is this, that Jesus is recognizing that each of us learns from the knocks of life because we're played cards which can shape us and which disturb us. I've known many people in my ministry where life has hit them hard, whether it's a serious illness or the loss of a loved one, the loss of a child, and they've been different people after the event. Think about it in your life. Have you ever found yourself stumbling around in your house in the dark, and when you turn on the lights, your eyes are unaccustomed and they flutter and they wonder what's happening? The truth is like that too. If God enlightens us all at once, 
we would be unable to bear it. Emily Dickinson, the writer, says, the truth must dazzle gradually or everyone might be blind. How true. And did you know that God dazzles us gradually in his truth? The psalmist would have it this way. He guides us into all the truth. In other words, it's the unfolding of God's word that gives us light and gives us understanding. One of the great things about visiting older people is they've understood that life can be hard, that people have to be forgiven, that people need care, and that people make mistakes. One of the problems of being young is sometimes people are too rash to judge and too quick to condemn. One of the joys and the graces of growing old is the expectation that we acquire a sense of wisdom. God reveals this wisdom in the process of life. And what he's revealing is the wisdom this, that there is a whole truth and nothing but the truth. We're being enlightened with what's real and we're beginning to see what really matters. One of the interesting things about life, particularly when people get older, is that they begin to choose to shut down the things that don't matter. And this becomes a challenge for all of us. Think about it. What's important to you? Is it wealth? Is it the acquiring of material things? Is it the perfect life? Is it what you see on Instagram posts or on social media? Or is it simply recognising it's feeling the touch of someone beside you? the gift of your partner, the love of your child, the acceptance of people who Mark Twain would have it, have to take you in because they're your family. It's interesting how hard it is for people to discover that kind of truth. Jesus, you see, offers us in the gift of the Holy Spirit, a teacher who causes us to obey, to accept, to love, and who challenges us to serve. This is our comfort. One of the great truths of the Gospel is this, that sometimes it will hurt because we have to accept our own frailties and we have to accept that we make mistakes. But God wants you to know that he recognises the truth and he seeks to support us to bear with it. Lou Evans, the American evangelist, said that the purpose of a preacher and a sermon is to irritate the comfortable and to comfort the irritated. It seems to me then in life that one of the real truths is to bear the irritations which become our lessons and therefore our comfort. God lets his Holy Spirit teach us through parents, through books, through wives, through husbands, through children and grandchildren. And we have to humbly accept the lessons that we meet in life. So this morning I would ask you this, look for the wisdom that's been part of your life, the learning of the systems that have shown you the faithfulness of God and the blessings he gives, and recognise that our role in life is to be a learner, to be open to the Spirit and to receive the teaching that God wants for us. Enter the narrow way, listen to God's will, Jesus says this, come unto me, take my yoke and learn from me. You see, if we're to be good people and effective, we need to understand that we don't know at all, that in fact we need to live to a different truth, that every day we can learn, in life, in the experience of relationships, in all that happens to us, we need to learn and relearn for the ways of God are not always the ways of man. Uh, but Schweitzer, in his book, The Quest for the Historical Jesus, says this, Jesus comes to us as one unknown, without a name. He comes by the lakeside, and he chooses men who did not know him. He speaks the words, follow me, and he sets out tasks, saying that he's come to fulfill these things in our time. And he commands us to love, to suffer, and to toil. And he does this with the experience of knowing and foretelling his own end, faithful to God, 
obedient to the Holy Spirit, and preaching the greatest truth of all, that love conquers everything, and that all that matters in the end is the nobility of living well by living selflessly, by dying to self-centeredness, and by loving sacrificially and unconditionally. Each of us this week live with expectations. We might have our thoughts about what's going to happen in the football. We might be thinking about re-emerging from furlough or lockdown. We'll be dealing with our families and the trials that they will bring. We'll be recognising our blessings and perhaps sufferings too. But in all of this, God is teaching us. He's teaching us this great truth, that he reveals much, but he gives us shoulders to bear the experiences of life. For he is carrying us, we stand on his shoulders, and he's there for us even to the end. Our prayer is to find a heart that can be taught, to hear the spirit of our justice, and most of all, to learn how to love. Amen. We make our prayers for the world and for other people. Loving God, keep your church on earth conscious of its privileges and responsibilities directs its leaders to suspend petty conflicts and pitiful arguments so that congregations of every denomination might be places of welcome and inclusion and loving service in their communities, particularly here in Brunsfield and Morningside and Merkiston. And so we remember our sister churches, St Peter's Catholic Church, Christ Church Episcopal Church, the Baptist Church, the Quaker Community, Morningside Parish Church, Chalmers Church, the Free Church of Scotland at Cornerstone. May we be a light to the people we serve. Might we always seek to work together so that our faith might be proclaimed, particularly as we move out of lockdown. And loving God, this morning we ask that you stir the hearts of people everywhere with an increased understanding of the preciousness and precariousness of life. And so we remember those who hunger when we have plenty, those who have no clean water or shelter when we have homes, those who work in sweatshops so that we can live cheaply, those who scrape by without the basic necessities of life, those who cannot be vaccinated because of poverty when we've all been vaccinated. Lord, create in us a sense of justice so that we can make a better world for the poor and the least. And loving God, we pray that you shatter our prejudices so that we can embrace all men and women who are in need. And so this morning we remember people with mental health problems, those who live on the streets, people who abuse alcohol and are addicted to drugs, sex workers, people on the margins of society, people who are depressed or socially anxious, living with mental health problems. Heavenly Father, give us the courage never to judge, but to look for our shared humanity, so that differences and lifestyles that challenge us might cause us to be thankful for what we have and inspire us to share our blessings with those who need help. And loving God, this morning we pray for those we know who are sick or ill, we remember those who are suffering from the effects of COVID, for those who are in hospital or hospice or care home. You know how they suffer, so bring healing and consolation to those in need and soothe the anxieties of those who care for them, granting them rest in you. And loving God, we pray today for our loved ones and we remember especially our families. We name them and all whom we love, laying their needs before you in a moment's silence. Loving God, we pray for our loved ones. We remember parents who feel inadequate to the task and want to do right. We think of those who are struggling in marriages and relationships and partnerships, frightened how this affects their children. 
We remember those who feel lonely and unloved, even when surrounded by their families. We think of families who struggle to make ends meet, or who find it hard to sustain family life. And we pray then that you fill our homes with your presence, that you might bring healing to broken relationships, that you might quieten angry hearts and silence bitter tongues, and that your presence might be a guard to those we love every day. So we ask these and all our prayers, thanking you for the gift of heaven and for Jesus who wonderfully bridged the life of heaven and life on earth. And so we remember, especially at this moment, those who have died and are now with you, counted with the saints in heaven. We think of those whom we've loved, whom we've lost, and we pray that you might bring your healing touch to the mourning and to the bereaved. Might they sense by your spirit that the people whom we love are counted with the angels and we shall see them again when we're called to our heavenly home. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. future that's before you, strengthen to go forth from this place with a hope and a renewal and a commitment to cherish family and friends. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest and remain with you and all whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen.